Welcome to the programme. It's Chris Warburton in for Victoria this morning until midday. And we're starting with this. If you're a male victim of domestic violence, how easy is it for you to speak up about what's happening to you? How easy is it to talk to people uh, and to try and get help? According to the British Crime Survey, nearly one and a half million people reported that they were the victims of violence at the hands of their partners between 2012 and 2013. That was the total. Around a third of those were men third of that million and a half. This morning we'll be hearing from some of them, finding out what help is currently available and asking whether it's enough as well. Under the terms of the British Crime Survey, just to lay it out for you, being a victim of abuse at the hands of your partner uh, can include many things. It ranges from non-physical abuse, like emotional and financial control, which we're going to hear about in a moment, uh, to more serious sexual assault and stalking. It also includes threats, plus use of minor and severe force as well. And the number of men seeking help, the number of men actually going for help, is on the up. The charity Mankind are reporting a 25% increase in calls to its support line each year. But charities say resources for both male and female victims are becoming stretched. Twelve organisations currently offer refuge or safe house provision for male victims in the UK. It's a total of 86 spaces, uh, of which 25 are dedicated to male victims. Uh, for context on that, there are over 260 organisations with around 4,000 spaces dedicated to female victims of domestic violence. Now, in a moment, we're going to hear from two charities who provide help and support for male victims of domestic violence. Um, one of those charities, one of those researchers as well, who we'll speak to, has been looking at the different provision which is ab available for the different genders. Uh, we'll give you the numbers of those organisations as well in case you feel you might need them. Uh, but clearly, want to hear from you this morning, want to hear your experiences. If you're a man who's been a victim of domestic violence, uh, whichever kind, whether it be physical, whether it be psychological, uh, perhaps it's a situation you're still in now, do give me a call this morning, 0500 909 693. Really interested to share your story with everybody else, I suppose, because it can, can be of assistance, as we know when we talk about these kind of subjects. The text number 85058, and we'll use my email this morning, which is chris at bbc.co.uk. The other side of it, perhaps you're listening, um, perhaps you're a woman who has or is still abusing her partner in some way. And perhaps you'd like to talk about that. Do feel free to get in touch on those same numbers this morning. Well, earlier on, I spoke to two men who have managed to get away from abusive relationships and get access to space in one of the refuges that I was uh, mentioning. They're called Will and Andrew. Both have very different experiences. And I began by asking Will about the relationship he was in and how the abuse began. Uh, initially, I lived with my partner for, th for seven or eight years before we got married. Um, actually, things things were good. It was a good relationship. Um, everything seems to be going fine. Um, and little things started to creep into the relationship, you know. Um, sort of didn't go out. Um, lost sort of my social circles. Um, basically, it was more staying in and being just one-on-one -on -one with my partner and um, things eventually tightened up from that and, and went on and on more of a, of a controlling um, aspect from my wife. Um, I found myself actually asking permission to do things in the end. Um, when you were actually sort of in that situation, you don't really know what your real life was all about before you started. Why did you feel like you had to ask permission? Because I, that, none of the abuse you received was physical, was it? So why did you feel you were in that position of having to ask to go and to do things? Well, um, again, it, it started um, after the relationship was going on for a while. Mm. Um, things like if I came in a little sort of late or not exactly on time, if I'd been shopping, if I'd been out with a few friends for the day, if I'd been walking... Uh, you'd you'd find the door locked. You'd find that um, you, your food would be in the bin and little things like little pointers. And you'd just think, you know, this you have to work around these things in a relationship. But in the end, it sort of became. I was afraid to say, I'm just going out for five minutes. It'd be, is it okay if I go out for five minutes? And I was started to think that this all one way and um, why. Why am I having to do things like this? Because it's a, it was a marriage uh, as opposed to a sort of um, 
living with parents and if you like well what did you think that i'm just trying to establish what you thought the consequences would be if you say did choose to go out with your friends unannounced or choose to go and spend some money without permission what what did you think the the result of that might be well ultimately you you think about your relationship ending um which which is uh it was to me at the time something i really didn't want you know absolutely not however when you sort of come in and wonder what type of mood your wife's going to be in mm. should i say this should i say that is it right is it wrong and you know i'm not talking overnight i'm talking a period of a couple of years and um i think she gained the upper hand psychologically and from then on it was mm. i was uh, like a pupil rather than with a teacher sort of thing relationship so it, it became in a sense all consuming that that defined the relationship did it the, the control on you on your behavior and effectively what you're describing you know removing the ability to to kind of make decisions for yourself on a day-to-day basis absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. simply because my wife said look i'm afraid of losing you but in hindsight now looking back at that it was nothing of the court she's she was a, a control freak, and there is no doubt about that at all. Did you still love her? I still do. You still do? Yes. Which must make it even harder to think about what you went through. Absolutely, because the uh, the, the ending factor for me, although the relationship is over, I realise that now, um, she actually, I said, look, we're going through a bad patch. We, we needed to talk. We needed to sort of sort our relationship out. Uh, I suggested marriage counselling. No, no, uh, we. I can sort this out. I can sort this out. Well, I knew from that day we were sort of damned then, if you like, and I thought I really started thinking it's time to get out. Um, although I said I'd never leave her, never, ever, um, I did. Explain, uh, explain to people how you can still be in love with a woman who seems to have put you through so much. Um, I go back to what I said previously, you know, I was a 13-year relationship. Um, I can say probably only the last four, maybe five years, it really went that bad, particularly bad over the last 18 months. And when things are so good and life flies by and you're enjoying what you're doing, I, I, you don't you don't think about the bad things when things are going ba- uh, going well. Uh, unfortunately things did sour and you still try and fight through it but in the end it was just forced upon me mm. and, and that was that was the end of the relationship basically was it easy to find a way out no um the situation was i said to my wife and this 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 is the the crux of, of the relationship she actually phoned one morning six thirty in the morning I was actually leaving, I'd packed the car, she phoned the police and accused me of attacking her, beating her up. Well, it's absolutely rubbish. The police came, they saw exactly for what it was. They cautioned um, both of us, basically, but they took me from the house. That was the last time I was ever there. The the statements were read out, I saw everything and the police looked and said, we've got to follow procedure. Uh, we all, we know what's gone on, so it's best you just stay away. And that 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 was four months ago. And to this minute, I don't really understand what can turn a person to do that to someone else who they've lived with for thirteen years. Mm. You've now clearly, you know, gone on to another chapter of your your life. Um, what are you left with? After all of this, will as you said, you know, your your wife was controlling access to friends and uh, and and so many other aspects of your life by the sound of things. What, what? It was everything, you know, mm. financially. Um, uh, she took care uh, of all the accounts and uh, basically everything. So inevitably, it's going to go down the legal road. She's still adamant that everything's hers, nothing's mine. Um, including the car, the dogs, down to the, the, the saucepans and pans, which is, you know, something I don't really want to go to. But when you build up a relationship over 13 and you're 13 years and you're forced, you're forced out of the relationship, 
then you have to start from scratch, you know, and I'm not a young man anymore, um, so it's going to be quite difficult. But I've set my mind to the fact that that's the way it is. I have to get on. My relationship is over, for sure. Um, and I can only look forward to to the future and th where, for once in five years, I can say, look, you've got to look after yourself. Well, it's you, um, and you have to move on from here. Mm. Andrew, how much of what you're hearing resonates with you, particularly in terms of this kind of the, the, the pattern of behaviour that people talk about, this controlling aspect that a partner can, can put upon another? Well, basically, it's uh, the same incident as well. Mm. With my ex-partner, she was controlling plus... Uh, physically hitting me, um, biting me, and also um, locking me out of the flat. Um, and I've been in hospital a couple of times due to the injuries she's uh, given me since we were in the relationship for nine months. And in that time, with uh, she's physically assaulted me various times in in that time which is horrendous you've been hospitalized on on two separate occasions you're saying i mean what what kind of injuries did you sustain then i suffered uh, a cut above my eye a burns to my chest from a hot drink um, I've had bruises where she's literally bit me um, and basically I've had to have ultrasound where I've been kicked in, into your yeah, kidney, ribs and also uh, I've had to try and restrain her but with her being bigger than me mm. it's been hard for me to do that yes oh, I, I do feel for you Andrew um, and and you know like you say this is this is somebody else who who's bigger than you so in terms of how you felt you could respond you, you know you're not the type of person to lash out in response clearly no no it's something I'd never do I'd never hit a woman anyway mm. Mm. but um, it's just a case where I had to just walk away. I couldn't uh, cope with it anymore. Um, so. I think what what Andrew's saying is um, is very similar. You know, mm. you, you're actually so involved in making that relationship work. Then you, you, it it takes so much time for you to realise that things aren't right. You're in denial. I, I certainly was, and I think Andrew was. So you didn't, you didn't think you were in an abusive relationship at all, Will? No, I, I st I've talked to sort of uh, counsellors. I've downloaded on people since, and I think, you know, m much the same as Andrew. And it was the one line I kept getting from, is why are you continually blaming yourself for everything? Well, it's, which, I, you know, it's hard to get out of your mind mm. and, you must be doing something wrong. That's why your relationship's not working. But it's absolute, absolutely wrong. You, absolutely you didn't, wrong. you didn't think you were to blame, did you, Andrew? No, um, it was because she had Asperger's syndrome, um, which she tended, it tended to switch her brain on and off over. Uh, the relationship um, and no maybe once or twice I did uh, confront her but um, basically it's just a mental state mm. that caused her to do these things did you feel you could talk to anyone about what was happening did you talk to anyone about what was happening I spoke to my social worker about it and she uh, rung my mother up to see if I could stay there for a week 
before coming here, which she did. Um, and she did various uh, ringing round to try and find a refuge that they could go to. Mm. And this was the only one available at the time. And, of course, all my friends are lost due to my ex-partner as well. So now I'm just trying to make build my life back up again. And how are you feeling about that? How are you feeling about the future? Um, I'm hoping to go back to the southwest where I came from, mm. which... Um, would be better for me but and try and try and make things right again yeah will you said you downloaded to people now you know clearly you're you're, you're confident of talking about what happened to you now but at, at the time i guess it was part of the situation in as much as as you say uh your partner had been controlling access to friends and family and, and that kind of thing so how easy was it to tell people what was going on inside your relationship? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. First and foremost, you know, you don't even know that there are people to talk to. You know, I don't know. The area that I, that I come from is very much a, a sort of a male-dominated society. Um, if a man's got a problem, then it's sort of, well, you just deal with it yourself. Over the time, you realise that, you can't and i don't think i ever envisioned myself talking about my problems to anyone um outside my relationship but when i found out made some phone calls looked online um about the the dean project in wales and the gualia support group uh, you don't realize that these people are actually there and they've dealt with this over a number of years and it was actually a relief to talk to these people you know what just a 10 minute interview with my local town um, opens up doors and you think well perhaps I'm really not on my own I can do something about it mm. you as a uh, I, I guess as a, as a as a male supposed to be head of the family and everything else it's a sign of weakness but I understand that that's absolute rubbish absolute rubbish and um, uh, a problem shared and all that is um, was a was a welcome relief honestly. yeah but, that, but that's interesting you say that because there will be people listening i'm sure who are going through similar scenarios that you went through who will be thinking in the same way that you did that you can't come forward as a man because it's a sign of weakness um which as you're saying now you can look back and say that's rubbish that'll be i'm sure that'll be useful information uh for for people who might be in a similar scenario as yourself this morning i hope so simply because until you actually step outside your your comfort zone into mm. that that help help environment then then I, I you've nothing to lose you know it's confidential it's um totally respectful and you've got to give these people they do in they they've been there with other people and they actually know what they're doing i am was not i could never ever envisage myself talking about my problems my family problems my wife and i but I find now that this almost comes into conversation anyway. So it's certainly helped me, certainly, certainly helped me. There's no doubt about that. That was Will and Andrew, uh, who you were hearing from. Two men who were abused by their partners have since managed to find space in a refuge. Uh, a few of your texts, this one from Jim saying, he, and he's referring to Will, who we heard from there, is currently describing my relationship. It's opened my eyes and it scares me. Uh, Duncan in Oxford says, I suffered domestic violence and abuse until I left and divorced my previous partner. We have a son together who resides with his mother, but the abuse continues through control of my contact to my son, a circle of abuse that is nigh on impossible to break. Um, your thoughts, very welcome, 0500 909 693. If you heard the accounts of Will and Andrew and thought this sounds very familiar, uh, then do get in contact. The text number is 85058. I'm going to speak to Mark Brooks, who's the chairman of Mankind, which is a national charity providing help and support to male victims of domestic violence and abuse. Morning, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. And also Tangam Debonair, who's the research manager of the charity Respect, which provides support for men facing abuse, also for male and female purpose.
perpetrators. Good morning to you, Tang Am. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, Mark Brooks, first of all, I mean, I want to talk about that whole issue of, uh, of how easy or otherwise it is for men to come forward and actually start discussing the situation they're in. But just on that point, but before you even get to that point, I suppose, it's, it's realising that you're in an abusive relationship for some. Will was saying it took so long to realise that things weren't right. I mean, clearly in Andrew's case, it would have been more obvious the, the, the extent of the physical harm that was being put his way. But there will be many people experiencing the kind of control that Will describes so well who might not even appreciate they're in an abusive relationship. That would be correct, and uh, certainly from the people that call us, um, we, we find that for many of them, they've been, been in an abusive relationship or been controlled for at least five years before they've actually realised. And I think for men, there certainly is the issue around the way that it actually undermines their masculine identity and, and sense of being a man because they don't expect to be a victim of domestic abuse mm. so you've you've got to get across through that barrier before you actually start to recognize and trying to escape from the situation that you're actually in mm. and that's why the statistics show on a british crime survey consistently that men are you know they're twice as likely not to tell anybody that they're a, a victim of partner abuse and domestic abuse than a female victim but if you're not being physically abused there will be some people listening to this thinking well what's to stop you trying attempting to take back some of the control that your partner is putting on you well it depends how you want to take the relationship forward i mean we often get when men call us that they have tried that that they're still in love with their partner. Mm. They think that they can change their partner. But it does come to a situation, and I think, you know, um, we'll reach that point where actually you can't go any, f any forward with that relationship. And the important thing is, is that to make sure that there are escape routes available, that men are actually confident that they can leave that relationship but also importantly that friends and family also provide that support and support network for those men to actually leave because one of the challenges is is for men is that they fear that they won't be believed not so much that if they go to the police or to their GP but also to their friends family or work colleagues that if they say to one of their colleagues at work, I'm a victim of domestic abuse or I think I am, then that is a major step for them and so many of them don't make that journey well, is because there, they don't think that they will actually be believed when they bring it forward. And so, do some of them fear that there'll be an assumption on behalf of the person they're talking to that there must be something of a two-way street? Well, I, if you'd asked me that question five years ago, Mm. I, I would have said yes, but I think that I think that gradually pe people are actually realising that men can be victims and are victims of domestic abuse as are female victims, and so um, I, th I think people are now have a broader mind to actually recognise that if people actually do come forward. The challenge is for people is to look out and recognise any changes in behaviour of any of their male friends and then think is that domestic abuse yes that's interesting isn't it but then i suppose that's all the harder to do if the partner who is carrying out the abuse has already in some way isolated their their partner from their friends which is part of the whole control pattern we hear about yes absolutely i mean that that is that is an issue and that is obviously a barrier, but one of the things that we've been calling for as a charity, and I know um, others have as well, is really for politicians and, and police and crime commissioners and others to really take a lead on this because, I mean, it's great that Five Live are covering this this morning, and I know our helpline, men's helpline and men's advice line and others will be receiving a, a real uplifting calls during today and over the weekend and next week but what we're lacking is political leadership on this issue we there's lots of speeches there's lots of policy around supporting female victims which is brilliant 
I mean, there needs to be more of that. Mm. But it's precious little political leadership on actually supporting male victims. And once that leadership is there, once it's talked about more openly at a higher level in our society, then we will start to see more support services and more men actually realise there are ways to escape. That it is out there. OK. Um, listen, uh, Mark, if you can uh, hold there for us, and uh, Tangam as well, because I know that you've been researching the differing ways that men seek help compared to women, Tangam, uh, and indeed the kind of uh, support that is available to them. So we'll get into all of that in due course, and we're going to speak to some callers as well, but I think we're going to break for the news first of all, so if you can hold on for a few minutes, uh, I'll be grateful. It's 10.33, let's get the latest headlines from Rachel. On digital, online, smartphone and tablet, this is BBC Five Live. Plans to allow unpaid tax to be seized directly from people's bank accounts have been attacked by a group of MPs. Under the proposals, HM Revenue and Customs would be able to access accounts if people owed more than £1,000 in tax or tax credits. The prosecution is beginning at the trial of Rolf Harris, who's accused of historical sex offences. The 84-year-old has arrived at Southwark Crown Court with his wife. His trial is expected to last six weeks. The Co-op Bank is to try to raise £400 million to bolster its finances. The part of the bank owned by the cooperative group will drop from 30 to 20 per cent. American military and law enforcement experts have arrived in Nigeria to help search for 200 schoolgirls who've been kidnapped. U.S. officials say they'll do everything they can to free those taken by the Islamic militant group Boko Haram. And 11,000 members of Russia's armed forces have taken part in its annual Victory Day parade, 69 years after the Nazis surrendered to the Soviet Union. In a speech to mark the occasion, President Putin promised war veterans that he would protect Russia and its glorious history. Two o'clock this afternoon, Kermode and Mayo will be joining you, as always, on a Friday afternoon. Stephen Mangan going to be with Simon and Mark later, live in the studio to talk about Postman Pat the movie, uh, plus Mark's review of Sabotage Frank, The Wind Rises and The Canyons as well. So Kermode and Mayo, as ever, from two o'clock this afternoon. Hugh's got the latest sports news for you. Thank you, Chris. Well, it seems that this moment won't deprive Phil Jones of being part of the England World Cup squad named by Roy Hodgson on Monday. And uh, Figaro has picked up a knock there. Phil Jones came powering forward. Jones went clattering into Figueroa. And, and ironically, Jones is the man who's come off the worst of that. And he was taken to hospital for an x-ray, but the Manchester United interim manager Ryan Giggs says Jones will be fit for the World Cup. But both the defender, who has that shoulder problem, and Wayne Rooney, who Giggs says will also be OK for Brazil, are out of their final Premier League game of the season at Southampton on Sunday. FIFA have clarified the position over Sepp Blatter's future. Earlier they confirmed a report in the Swiss newspaper Blick quoting Blatter saying he would be a candidate for president again and stand for a fifth time. But FIFA now say he told the paper he would like to stand again and has merely maintained his position that he will only do so if it is the will of the confederations and associations. Andy Murray could have another top 100 player alongside him in the Davis Cup next year. Alias Bedeni of Slovenia is to declare his allegiance to Britain. More on this exclusive Exclusive story from our tennis correspondent Russell Fuller. If the 24-year-old's ongoing application for a British passport is successful, he will be eligible to represent GB next February, three years after his last appearance for Slovenia. Britain will play next year's World Group first round tie in March, and my understanding is that Andy Murray will have the ultimate say. If the Wimbledon champion is unhappy at the prospect of playing alongside a man who was born and brought up in another country, then Badeni would not be considered. But if Murray gives the move his blessing, then Badeni, who last year reached a career-high ranking of 71 before being restricted by a wrist injury, could become a valuable asset to the team. His best surface is clay, and he appears to have the potential to become a regular member of the world's top 50. Well, British Davis Cup player Dan Evans has questioned Badeni's intentions to compete with him for a place in the team. So a guy's becoming British who has already played for his country doesn't quite sound right to, right to me, he's tweeted. Meanwhile, world number one Serena Williams has withdrawn from her quarter-final against Petra Kvitova in Madrid with a thigh injury.
Let's go to Aberdeen next and find out what chance of England and Scotland starting their one-day international anytime soon. Here's Kevin Howells. Uh, not a great chance, I'm afraid. Manorfield, the home of Aberdeenshire Cricket Club, remains right dreek at the moment, which means a lot of things, especially too wet for cricket. Already, we're busy checking the last possible start time. That's 4.17 this afternoon, which would allow 20 overs per side. The forecast is due to improve a little later on, but what damage will be done between now and then, we don't know. Even the Scottish Pipe Band, which is the Robert Gordon's College of Aberdeen, huddled in the nearby tent. It's not stopping them from keeping morale up, I'm pleased to say, and playing a tune or two, but it can't hide the frustration being felt right now and what is the biggest day in cricket in this city since Don Bradman scored a century back in 1948 but in 2014 it remains very wet and a delayed start Kevin thank you when it does get underway uh, it'll be on 5 Live uh, Sports Extra between now and then pipes I guess first practice for the Spanish Grand Prix is just finished with Lewis Hamilton fastest in his Mercedes more than half a second quicker than the rest of the field McLaren's Jensen Button was second a second practice uh, is on BBC Two and the BBC Sport website it starts at one o'clock this is BBC Five Live on digital online smartphone and tablet in travel news we'll start in Greater Manchester with the M60 anti-clockwise it's because the road is closed at Junction 4 for the M56 Shaston link all because of an accident. Congestion uh, goes back on the M56 actually to Junction 3 at Bagley. Elsewhere in Glasgow, the M8 eastbound between Junctions 20 and 19 just after the Kingston Bridge. A car's broken down blocky one lane with slow traffic back to the M77 at Junction 22. Falkirk, the M9 southbound now back to normal between Junctions 6 and 5. Also looking better in West Yorkshire on the eastbound M62 at Junction 25 at Brighouse. And Lancashire, the M6 southbound between Lancaster Services and Junction 32 for the M55. An accident and a fuel spillage being dealt with. Two lanes are closed with heavy congestion back to Junction 33. Michelle Dignan, 5 Live Travel. First for breaking news. This is 5 Live. We're going to cross to the Commons. Vince Cable is uh, responding to an urgent question about the AstraZeneca takeover bit. And our focus is what, on what is best for the UK, securing great British science, research and manufacturing jobs and decision making in the life sciences sector. First for breaking news. This is 5 Live. And it's Chris Warburton with you this morning in for Victoria with you until midday. Then it's going to be Tony Livesey joining you for lunchtime from 12 till 2. Uh, we're talking about male victims of domestic violence this morning. According to the British Crime Survey, nearly one and a half million people are reported to be victims of violence at the hands of their partners between 2012 and 2013. Around a third of those were men. We've heard some... Uh, emotional accounts from people who have found themselves in very different types of abusive relationships, psychological and the physical as well. And uh, we're hearing from you as well this morning on 85058. David says, your first interview with Will reveals how difficult it is to balance your love with a basic standard of civility in an intimate relationship. Some partners have little sense of fairness and combined with an ability to be cruel to others, they can take control of the atmosphere in the home which erodes and corrodes everything that have been there before. I know because I've experienced it. It's even harder with children because the kinder of the two partners feel they need to protect the children more than themselves. John in Northampton says, I was ashamed to admit that I was controlled by my now ex-wife. Uh, this is one of the most important programmes I've heard. It's not a weakness to seek help. Uh, in terms of seeking help, a couple of phone numbers for you, if you're hearing this and thinking that you need someone to speak to. Two numbers for you. Mankind National Helpline. Mankind is the charity uh, that we've been speaking to uh, Mark Brooks from. He's the chairman of that charity. The number's 01823 334 244. So 01823 334 That's Mankind. And then a helpline which is run by the charity Respect. Uh, it's called the Men's Advice Line, which is 0808 801 0327. 0808 801 Zero three two seven. If you didn't get those down in time, then uh, obviously the programme's going to be up on the iPlayer from about midday. Uh, so listen back to around about this time and you can uh, take down those numbers again. Um, I mentioned the Respect charity. Let's speak to Tangam Debonair now, who's been holding on for us, research manager of that particular charity. Uh, morning again, uh, Tangam. Uh, just tell us, because I, I mentioned that you're, you're researching the differing ways that men go about seeking help compared to women. How easy or otherwise, do men find it to get out of these kind of relationships? 
Good morning, Chris. Well, first of all, I think both male and female victims, as Mark has said, find it difficult for all sorts of reasons. Mm. And that's why we've been running the National Helpline, the Men's Advice Line, since 2006. And last year alone, we helped 4,517 callers and 1,548 email um, contacts. So we know that people do need help. And we're really pleased that we and other charities like Mankind can provide that. But as to how difficult it is, I think for a range of reasons, we don't know enough yet about how men's and women's needs are similar and how they're different. We also run a helpline for perpetrators of domestic violence, both female and male, so anyone who's listening who thinks they need help with their own violent behaviour towards their partner can get that help. But for men, one of the reasons we're doing research with the University of Manchester is because we're picking up in our monitoring of our helpline calls that there are some significant differences between men's needs and women's needs. Some things are similar, some things are different. Like what? Give us an idea. Well, Will said it himself. You're one of your men who, who spoke earlier very bravely. I mean, M- M- Will mentioned that he lived in a male-dominated society yes. and said that it w- he knows now that it's rubbish to say that men should be head of the family and therefore both men and women need help. But I think what what that resonated for me was that it doesn't help men or women to live in a male-dominated society. It doesn't help male victims who feel that it's difficult for them to come forward and it doesn't help women either. So I think that's one of the things that's, that's important. Will actually pick that up for himself. Yes. I mean, he said if you're a man, there's an expectation where I live that you deal with it yourself yeah. and you can imagine that a lot of people would be thinking that exact same way. Exactly but I'm pleased to say that many men and women do come forward each year men and women can and do have the same legal rights, they do use police protection housing and civil law but there are gaps in services, there's no doubt about it yeah, well, you, plus we mm. do have a chronic housing shortage full stop, both male victims and female victims are de- dealing with the same difficulties other people are dealing with and trying to get somewhere safe to live after they've left an abusive relationship. Different, different charities have got different attitudes on this. I'd be interested to know what you think because the Women's Aid, the National Domestic Violence Charity, they they've, they challenge these Office of National Statistics um, figures that we've got here, um, the ones that suggest men and women are pretty close uh, in terms of uh, the frequency in which they're affected by domestic violence. That particular charity say the severity, the extent, the pattern of violence is significantly greater for women. They say women are far more likely to experience more than one form of violence from a man uh, also sexual violence as well I, I, I don't know what do you believe the reality to be given that you deal with both genders well I'm not just say, talking about beliefs here. I don't think women's aid are either the actual evidence from the same British crime survey I mean, you said yourself 1.5 million victims in total one third of whom are male so that's a significant number of men but also women's aid are picking up from the British crime survey as we do that there are differences men are less likely to experience or at least talk about sexual violence men are significantly less likely to be killed by violence partner but that doesn't diminish the importance of helping both men and women and I know neither Women's Aid nor we would diminish the importance of helping men and many members of Women's Aid as many members of Respect are helping male victims locally we actually help some of those local services to get better skilled at that so I'm pleased to say to Mark I can reassure him many local politicians and police and crime commissioners are definitely on this and are contacting us for help with improving how local services respond to male victims so it isn't about belief actually if you look at the evidence you can see that the majority of victims of chronic long-term violence are female but there are also chronic long-term male victims sure. as well so we have to help them both but in different ways if they have different needs on that mark brooks um, from uh, mankind um that call when a, when a call goes into the police the police arrive at the scene is there a problem still because you were saying attitudes have changed uh from your experience and, and people are, are seeing this as very much a a real problem in our society uh, that exists perhaps in bigger numbers than we might have previously thought. When police arrive at the scene, are they thinking in the same way that you're describing or are assumptions too often made about this, the scenario they're seeing in front of them and who might be responsible? Again, I, I, I mentioned earlier, if you'd asked me that question five, ten years ago, I would have said that the police would have made an assumption that the female was the victim and the male was the perpetrator. Yes. That has changed. Um, we've seen that with the number of prosecutions and court cases for female perpetrators, that the police are actually taking that as a reality in terms of when they turn up, they have um, they don't have a biased view. They have... Uh, a view that's based on the evidence that they see with their own eyes. So they're not going there with the uh, 
perceptions or, or, or that they perhaps would have had five, ten years ago. And, and that's been a great leap forward. There's far more training for police officers about the need to support all victims of, from all genders. And also um, there, there is that recognition that there are support services now growing for male victims out in the community. So if things are changing. So if you are a victim, you will get f a fair hearing and good treatment from the police, so please do come forward. Well, do let me know if that's been your experience as well, if uh, if what Mark is saying resonates with you, 0500 909 693, if you've had a, a slightly different experience with the criminal justice system, 85058, chris at bbc.co.uk is the email. Uh, let's speak to John, who's in the West Country. Morning, John. Hello there. How are you? I'm very well, actually. I mean, this is quite... Um, this is quite a turn up for the books because I was on the show, I was on Nikki's show about two and a half years ago, right. having just split up from uh, my abusive partner and I was in a real mess when I was on the show right. and um, I was almost in, t you know, I had difficulty not breaking down. I can say that there was light at the end of the tunnel. My life now is fantastic. Um, I have a job. I have self-respect, I have self-esteem, I have a wonderful woman in my life. Uh, the, the boy that me and my ex adopted is doing very well at school. Um, but I, in a way, I feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for her because she will never know um, the happiness that I have now. Um, but the, the, to all intents and purposes, we were the perfect family. You know, we lived in a chocolate box cottage in the in the middle of the West Country. It was beautiful, and to all intents and purposes, we were the perfect family. She was a saint because we'd adopted this boy. And But behind closed doors, she had a drink problem. She had a drug problem. I was continually not up to it. Um, and actually, what I see now is a lot of the things that I was accused of was her projecting her problems onto me. I mean, and... Um, I think it runs in her family because whenever I used to say to her, you are such a bully, she would say to me, if you think I'm bad, you should see my sister. Now, her sister's husband committed suicide, and knowing what I know now, I know why he committed suicide. And when I left my ex, her and her sister ganged up on me and tried to get me to kill myself. Um, fortunately, I had good family around me. I had the responsibility of looking after this young, vulnerable boy that we'd mm. adopted. And um, if I hadn't have had any of that, I may well have killed myself. I, when I split up from her, I, I try and keep it as brief as possible. When I split okay. up from her, I got in touch with the local council to say, look, I'm going to be homeless. I've got a, a young boy with me. We need emergency accommodation. And they gave me a number to phone up. The guy said, oh, phone this number. So I phoned the number up. And when uh, the lady picked up the phone, she said, you first helping victims of domestic abuse. And I said to her, I think I've got a wrong number here. And she said, well, tell me what your circumstances are. I told her the situation and what was going on. And she said, you are a classic case of domestic abuse, you know, mm. and we met up. And she drew a diagram of the cycle of abuse, and that's exactly what it was. Um, my ex-partner was very clever. She's a very sly, devious woman, and she would tell people that I was the abuser. And actually, when I think about it now, I was the one that used to hide upstairs in the bedroom and dread hearing her footsteps come upstairs mm. because I knew I was going to get a load of abuse. And what finally did it, and I would advise any guy that is suffering from this, you know, deal with it because otherwise it's just going to go on, mate. And it will be hard after you split up. It will be hard, but anything is better than what you're putting up with now. And what did it for me was my partner, who is a therapeutic counsellor and works for charities dealing with vulnerable children and families, bullied and threatened me into having counselling. And I was a bit resistant to it. And she said, if you don't have counselling, we're through. So I went and had the counselling. The first day I came back from my counselling, she was sat there on the sofa and she had this look of absolute 
terror in her eyes because the last thing she wanted was the counselling to work. Yes. She needed me to be broken so that she could just do whatever she wanted with me. And as the counselling progressed, I realised that actually it wasn't me that had the problems, it was her. And I finally plucked up the courage and I left with nothing. I mean, me and my boy, we left with nothing. And, um... You've been able to you've been able to rebuild, yeah, which is amazing. It's fantastic! It's been fantastic. Well, look, look. I, I, you know, when when we split up, um, she did things to me that hurt the boy, and that is what I don't understand: sure. is how she could have done these things to hurt me, knowing that they would hurt him as well. Well, look, John, thank you, uh, thank yeah, you well, for. I would just say, any guy that is going through it, it's hell now, mate, and it will be hell when you split up. But a few months later down yeah. the line, you'll be standing tall. With, you know? the, with, with the love of a good woman, as yeah. you've proved. Well, yeah, you don't, you don't even need the love no, of a good woman. No, no, indeed, but in your case, woman is great, it helps. It helps. You're standing straight, mate, on your own two yeah. feet, yeah. and you're not, you know... You can live your life. Yes, indeed. All right, John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, John, who's given us a call this morning, 0500 909 693. If you've got a similar experience to John, if you're in a situation yourself which you're finding really hard to get out of, do give us a bell and uh, we'll try and speak to you before midday, 0500 909 693. Thank you to Mark Brooks as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Brooks is the chairman of Mankind. And to Tangam Debonair. Thank you, Tangam. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Research manager of the charity Respect. Uh, for the final 10 minutes of the programme, before we hand over to Tony, let's return to something we were talking about right at the beginning of the show. And uh, that was the experience of male victims of domestic violence. We heard some, uh, well, some startling accounts, in fact, actually, of uh, some of the experience that people have had to go through. And uh, in terms of the numbers, according to the British Crime Survey, around one and a half million people now say they were the victims of violence at the hands of their partners uh, between the years 2012 and 2013. And a third of them were men. Uh, Tangham Debonair is the research manager of the charity Respect, which provides support for men facing abuse and also for male and female perpetrators. We're picking up in our monitoring of our helpline calls that there are some significant differences between men's needs and women's needs. Some things are similar, some things are different. Like what? Give us an idea. Well, Will said it himself. You're one of your men who, who spoke earlier very bravely. I mean, Will mentioned that he lived in a male-dominated society yes. and said that it, he knows now that it's rubbish to say that men should be head of the family and therefore both men and women need help. But I think what, what that resonated for me was that it doesn't help men or women women to live in a male dominated society it doesn't help male victims who feel that it's difficult for them to come forward and it doesn't help women either i mean he said if you're a man there's an expectation where i live that you deal with it yourself yeah. and you can imagine that a lot of people would be thinking that exact same way exactly but i'm pleased to say that many men and women do come forward each year men and women can and do have the same legal rights they do use police protection housing and civil law but there are gaps in services there's no doubt about it yeah, well, you, plus we mm. do have a chronic housing shortage full stop both male victims and female victims are de dealing with the same difficulties other people are dealing with and trying to get somewhere safe to live let's speak to simon who's in london and also mark who's in manchester morning to both of you morning Chris. morning, morning. thanks for giving us a call uh simon what's what's been your situation then um i've lived in um an abusive relationship with my wife for about 15 to 16 years took me an awful long time to notice it's very subtle um, very subtle changes, but um, anyway, eventually, long and short of it is eventually the light bulb has gone off. Um, I'm at the tail end of it now. Divorce is almost finalised. It's been absolute hell, but the relief is quite palpable. Um, tell, 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 really tell, 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 give, give us an idea of what you went through, if you could. I mean, oh, you know, was it was it was it physical? Was it mental? No, a bit it's, of both? All, it's, no it's all it's all mental mm. and um, psychological. Um, it's um, con complete control of your social group, um, com complete control of any social contact outside of friends with your par controlling partner, um, financial control, which, which is immense, obviously. Because, um, controlling someone's money is obviously a very effective way of potentially yeah. controlling someone's life. Um, but how, how did, because this was a question I was putting earlier on to Will, who we spoke to. I mean, how, how did it get to that point? Simon, it, was it? Did you fear trying to wrestle some of that control back because you were afraid of losing your 
wife. Was was that it? I'm, I'm not too sure. I mean, from a personal point of view, um, the reason it took me so long to notice, first of all, from a personal point of view, was my, a lack of my own self-esteem and almost a feeling that this is almost what I deserve. Um, the other thing, it's very difficult as well uh, for the machismo, the male machismo, to acknowledge the or being abused by your wife. Um, the biggest thing about it I've found is people tend to judge others by their own behaviour, and I wouldn't I wouldn't behave like that. And you do spend year upon year upon year upon year almost waiting for the other person to notice their behaviour, and it'll change. Um, and then you have to come to a point eventually where you suddenly realise that it just isn't. They um, they don't have the ability to change. I don't mm. think. Um, I think I think a lot of the behaviour is quite deliberate and calculating. Um, these these people tend to live in their own narcissistic and self centred little world of their own, um, and have, don't have any ability or, or desire even to come out of it. Um, they, they don't have any ability whatsoever to empathise or to walk in another's shoes or to consider others' feelings. It's all self, 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 self. And where do you think that came from? With, I, think, with, with I, think it's, I think in this particular, my particular case, it's nurture. I think it's passed down the generations. Really? Just the way she, she was brought up, the, the way she, she saw relationships, the way she saw the world? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think my marriage has been a, a complete mirror image of her parents' marriage. I, um, I think it's, like I said, a complete mirror image, um, scarily so in, in, in some ways. And she's obviously spent her childhood looking at the way her mother speaks to and treats her father. And it becomes normal. Um, and, um, I mean, that leads me actually on to one of the main points about why it's so, so important when you do recognise you're, you're in this sort of relationship for yourself and for your children to get away because... The, the biggest threat people will use about you threatening to divorce another person is, is invariably children. Now, it's a very powerful threat, mm. but any threat is only a threat if you allow it to become one. And the most important thing, though, is if you do stay in this sort of relationship, or any relationship, um, for the sake of the children, you're almost condoning the behaviour. You're teaching your children that that is okay, that is acceptable, that is normal. And... Do we really want to pass that on? Something has, you have to break. You have to break the line somewhere. Did you, do you think your children uh, had any kind of idea of what was leading? What in the end has led to your um, your breakdown of your? Uh, I don't know. They're very young, um, uh, and they're not stupid. Children, children, no, children aren't stupid. They're, none of them are as stupid as we think they are sometimes they're much 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 more aware than we give them credit for as yeah. adults my, my, my three-year-old can be pretty stupid <laughs> <laughs> i'm saying that in a nice way yeah, yeah. yeah but that's the thing that makes them so cute as yeah, well exactly quite 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 yeah absolutely but, but yes but uh, um I, I i don't really know but they're, they're not stupid i mean going back to the thing i mean i i kind of have i've kind of come to the realization that when we are actually living our separate lives um my, she will possibly continue to indoctrinate them um, and criticise me, etc., etc., etc. And I can't influence that, and I just have to accept that. But I have to accept that in the future, they'll they'll eventually be free thinkers of themselves. They're not stupid. They they'll they'll see what's what rather than listen to what's being told. Yeah. And they'll make their own minds up. Sure. I mean, in terms of you know your your friends and all of that, and you were talking about the controlling behaviour, and we do hear about this, and we've heard about it today. This kind of pattern of behaviour where a partner begins to control finances, they begin to control the freedom that their partner has to go and see friends and what have you. Wasn't there a time where your friends were going? Hang on a second, Simon. Why don't we see you anymore? What's going on here? And didn't you well, start the, questioning? Hang on, why am I well, never I ever I see don't my mates? I think friends tend to do that. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, well, I whenever whenever my wife was criticised by friends, I would de- I would defend her. Um, so people tend not to say anything. Um, I, I find um, mainly for that reason, um, they don't want to be seen to criticise in someone's other half because most of us will defend it, especially when we're in denial about the relationship as well. Because to acknowledge what your friends are telling you is to acknowledge a fault or, a, I hesitate to use this word, but what you deem to be a weakness on your part as well. Yeah. So friends tend to keep stum. 
Was there times in your relationship where things were actually all right in between? Was she apologetic at all to the way she no, was? She, no, no. I mean, we've it was sort of been, consistently pretty much the same. We've known each other for twenty-one years, and she has not apologised to me on one single occasion in that time, which which is really quite extraordinary because nobody is that perfect. I'm sure. I'm sure even Jesus had to apologise now and again in his 30 years of life because people just aren't that perfect. But no, no, there's never been an apology. We have been to counselling, um, albeit much to her reluctance, and um, she doesn't apologise for it. She justifies the behaviour. She doesn't even deny it. She justifies it and in some respects even admits it. Um, there have been times in the past where I've challenged her on things that she's said to me and she would openly say to me, oh, Simon, I can't believe you fell for that. I was only doing it to hurt you, or I was only doing it to get what I wanted. Right. So it's quite deliberate. Right, OK. Um, uh, it's, it's good to speak to you, Simon, and thank you for coming on and, uh, and being so upfront with us. Uh, all the best to you. Uh, thank you.